Well, hello everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we know it's a tight schedule at Davos, so we appreciate everyone being here. My name is Enrique Acevedo, and I work for a media company that was built uh, around the power of diversity. Um, and not just gender or uh, race, but also points of view. By 2020, half of all US children are going to be part of a minority group, so we represent the changing face of America. I'm an anchor for Univision and a special correspondent for uh, This Is Fusion. And this year, we have partnered with the World Economic Forum to discuss and reimagine the 21st century dream. That's the name of our session. Um, on a more personal note, this is our third, fourth year uh, at, at Davos. We're really happy to be here. At first, I thought that the job of the moderator was like an orchestra director. You potentialize the talent of the people on stage. But now I realize it's more like running with the bulls in Pamplona. <laughs> the key here is to stay out of the way, to let you, the audience, fully enjoy the experience. So with that in mind and uh, with that spirit, I'm going to do a brief introduction of our very distinguished panel and ask them to share with us, to start this conversation, um, their 21st century dream. I'll start in order. Rodrigo Tejero mm -hmm. from Argentina, a young, young global leader and the founder, the director of uh, a, a very interesting startup in Argentina. Uh, tell us about it and, and welcome, Rodrigo. Yeah, from Recarga Pay. Recarga Pay. So it's a very wide question, right? So what I believe is that talent and dreams are evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. And in the last 20 years, there's two technologies that have been very important in the internet and the supercomputer that we have in our pockets, smartphone. And I want to share my example. I'm Argentinian. I live in Argentina. I have a company. It's a mobile wallet. And basically, we reach millions of people. We're 50 people in, in, in the company. But although we're, I'm in Argentina, I'm Argentinian, 99% of our business is outside of Argentina. It's a US company, and we've crowdsourced uh, the whole business. So we've raised millions of dollars uh, through this business. And what I want to share with that is that today this technology, the internet the smartphone, is actually allowing these opportunities for the vast majority of the people. So this is a dream that, that in, in my world has come true for me. So today I'm sharing this panel, and for me this is an incredible, I'm very grateful for it. So this is my dream in a sense. Thank mm -hmm. you, Rodrigo. Uh, Maximo Dice from South Africa, a uh, global shaper, a key. Oh. She's, uh, she's got more fans than Will I am, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell us about Simodisa, your, your startup in, in South Africa, and of course, briefly about your 21st century dream. Sure. So I'm Matsi Mudise. I'm a global shaper from the Soweto Hub in South Africa. And I run an industry association called uh, Simodisa, and it's about creating and building entrepreneurship ecosystems on the continent. It's a function of identifying what's required to move this paradigm of ensuring that we create an enabling environment for any entrepreneur to survive. Whether you're in San Francisco, whether you're in Johannesburg, we have to give you the ability to run and build your own business. So that's what I do, and I am passionate. I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm an entrepreneurship activist. Also, what's important is that I'm a young person. You know, I'm the current generation, not the future generation. We are the majority of um, you know, the world, the young people, the population, and we cannot be ignored. Uh, we have um, you know, been able to inherit key decisions of what the elder people have done, but we're also custodians of key decisions of now. But I also feel that young people are the leaders of the fourth industrial generation. And the 21st century dream means that it has to be inclusive. It has to have everybody feel like they're part of this dream. It has to be integrated. We all have to feel like we're plugged into the world. It has to be one that everybody feels that they have the skills to go into this world. We have to equip the young people with the skills and the ability. So the first 21st century dream is very, key, is very critical, and it's something that young people of today are going to lead. Inclusion, that's something we're going to be discussing, of course, tonight. Mutar Kent, the president and chief executive officer of the Coca-Cola company, who insisted that we had young global leaders and global shapers in our panel tonight. Of course, it's not something that we didn't want, but, uh, <laughs> but we, we, we recognize that, that, that uh, Mr. Kent, your 21st century dream. Yeah, well, first, um, I'm really proud that we um, started supporting the young global, the, the first and only 
um, a major company to start supporting the young global shapers. Uh, when Klaus and I talked about this uh, four or five years ago to bring uh, really a much younger voice to Davos. And um, it's the fourth year now, so I'm really proud uh, that uh, all of them are here and supporting uh, their fellow uh, young global shaper here. Um, but you know, I, I will tell you what my dream is around the three W's that we uh, always uh, follow at, in the Coca-Cola company to have stronger communities where we do business. The three W's are women, water, and well-being. And I hope that the um, fourth industrial revolution and all the technologies that come with that from nanotechnology to 3D printing to every single smart system uh, that is available to us uh, enables uh, us to uh, achieve uh, all those uh, goals that we have in our three W's. For women, three W's uh, are that we want to, uh, to um, have empower five million women outside of the four walls of the Coca-Cola company by 2020. We've got five years to go, and uh, we believe uh, that we can hopefully live that dream in this 21st century in uh, 2020. In water, uh, our goal was to be water neutral uh, by 2020. We've already achieved that in 2015. Our dream would be to achieve that in our down supply chain, where eight, 10 times more water is used in our supply chain than what we use in agriculture in all the things that we actually buy, that we can achieve that in our supply chain all the way down. When, the, when we do that, the world will be a place where water is respected much more than today. That's the dream there. And well-being um, is not just physical well-being, mental well-being, financial well-being. Uh, and so what we would like definitely is the inclusiveness that we don't have today in the world. The, 200 million unemployed goes away, and that we actually are able to, through all the technologies, all the smart systems, all the grids, uh, all the home smart systems, all the agricultural smart systems, factory smart systems, are able to have us actually create more net jobs than we lose. And that then we have a very inclusive world. That's the dream. The three W's. Thank, yes. you. Thank you so much. Um, representing the disruptors, Nathan Bachaski um, from Airbnb, co-founder and chief technology officer. Thank you so much for being here. Your 21st century dream. My dream is that anybody can be a micro entrepreneur. And by micro entrepreneur, I mean have the ability to earn a supplementary income. And this is what we see happening on, on Airbnb today. We have over a million hosts uh, in 100 91 countries uh, who share their home uh, and derive a second source of income. And I've seen the power of that second source of income. It gives people the space uh, and time and ability to take risk. And they often use that to, I've heard stories of many bootstrapping their business. Sometimes it's a tech business. Sometimes it's a bakery. Sometimes it's a young person. Sometimes it's a retiree. Sometimes they use this opportunity to follow a passion that takes them down the road of a nonprofit. So by giving people flexibility uh, and a little bit of extra income to pursue their dreams, I think is a powerful thing. Thank you so much. And uh, William Adams, also known as Will I Am, the founder of the I Am Foundation and uh, an award-winning musician and music producer. Thank you, sir, for being here tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, Would you share your 21st century dream with us? So I'll share my 21st century dream by just giving a snap hello picture of what the 20th century dream was and who wasn't a part of adding to that dream. So at the beginning of the 20th century, Africans, a lot of Latinos, were not a part of shaping the world. Women were not a part of shaping that world. And in the beginning of that 21st, that 20th century dream, people like Edison and Tesla, the byproduct of all the things that we're working on in, in electricity, created my industry, music. So we wouldn't have the music industry if it wasn't for GE and RCA, right? And I moved my mom out the projects 
in that industry, music. But, you know, coming out of poverty with music doesn't mean I'm able to change the neighborhood I come from. So my 21st century dream is to take all that I've, you know, earned from uh, music, and that's what I Am Angel is about, is teaching kids tomorrow's skill sets today. So I started an after-school program because you can't, it's hard, I don't know how to change the LA Unified School District or any school district in America. <laughs> I, I don't. So I started an after-school program where I teach kids robotics, computer science, GIS, global information um, systems, so they, they build maps. We send them off to China every year to learn Mandarin and Cantonese. And my 21st century dream is that the unlikely candidate are a part of this conversation on shaping the world and giving the tools today. Right, so who, who would have thought that a person from the projects that would stand in line and get free lunch and um, in the summertime because my mom couldn't afford to feed us um, and stand in line and get powdered milk and cheese would go around the world singing music and <clears throat> take care of my family and then risk all that money to start a consumer electronics company so I could show the kids in my neighborhood that they should dream to be Steve Jobs, not just Stevie Wonder, or Michael Dells, not just Michael Jackson's. Right, so if I didn't start my own consumer electronics company, they wouldn't have thought that that was possible. So after we sold Beats to Apple, I was one of the founding members of Beats, it gave me the ability and proof that look what we can do, guys. We don't just have to dream of being like musicians and athletes. We can be scientists and entrepreneurs and engineers and solve tomorrow's problems. And so taking what we've done in the ghetto that I'm from, I want to scale that and go to places like, you know, in, in Africa and Philippines and, you know, South and Central America with this proof that we can participate in shaping the world with tomorrow's skill sets. Uh, talking about unlikely candidates, I just want to point out that most of the members of this panel are immigrants. Some rose through the corporate ladder from nothing to everything, disruptors, uh, young entrepreneurs, people changing the world with music. So I think that speaks a lot about diversity and the power of, uh, of diversity too. Um, we want the audience to participate. It's part of what we encouraged this year. It used to be that they didn't let you take your cell phone out and do anything with it. Now, take your cell phones out, take pictures, share them. And also, um, you know, you can participate in a poll that we have today. Uh, and before I, I, I read you the question for the poll, which I have in my phone, sorry about that, um, I'm going to take out one of my favorite gadgets, this newspaper, and um, read you this headline from today. Uh, 2016 will be even worse than 2015, says the World Economic Forum. <laughs> The world will be a more dangerous place this year with everything from environmental catastrophes to the migration crisis. So with that in mind, I ask you if you're optimistic about the future. And uh, you can participate in our poll. Uh, you'll see the, the link there. It's uh, wef.ch slash 21c. Or you can tweet with the hashtag 21st century dream. We uh, had a meeting with Global Shapers yesterday because we wanted their voice to be included here too. Uh, with a group of them, and they, they already tweeted about their 21st century dream. Francis Solano from the Philippines say, I dream of a world where conflict because of resources is history and where the youth truly cares for the earth. Mayel Reed from San Francisco said, more equitable access to opportunity, optimism, over fear, and collaboration across differences. So that's part of what we have. You see, not at all optimistic, a little bit optimistic, very optimistic, you choose, and we'll have the results at the end so you can be part of this conversation. So I wanna talk about inequality in opportunity first, and that's something we talked about uh, in that lightning round, inclusion and, and equality. Um, I was talking about these numbers backstage. Uh, it costs around $400 for a kid to go through the school um, um, uh, process in, in Africa. We invest $400 in, in a kid in Africa. In the US and Europe, that figure is uh, around $100,000 from uh, kindergarten to, to high school. So with that gap, with that inequality, are we talking about just one dream or in different versions of that uh, 21st century dream? And uh, I'll start with Buntar Kent. Yeah, look, I think um, you know, 
there's inequality, uh, not just in the education system, but there's inequality in also access to water, basic hygiene, uh, um, um, uh, the health, the health uh, issue, um, uh, access to everything. Um, uh, so I think you know it's not just about education. There's huge gaps in the world today, and of course, you know everyone dream is that those uh, gaps uh, go away. Uh, they're not going to go away uh, themselves. Um, that 400 to 100,000 is not going to go away. The access to basic rights, dignity, all of that is not going to go away. Uh, freedom uh, is, uh, versus uh, having freedom, that g gap is not going to go away unless we do much, we have much more collaboration between um, government, business, and civil society. Governments can't do it alone. Businesses can't do it alone, and neither can NGOs do it alone. But I think we have enough examples, whether it be water conservation systems, whether it be employment opportunities for youth, whether it be gender uh, um, uh, opportunities uh, and getting rid of uh, gender disparities. We have enough examples where the golden triangle, I call it, between government, business, and civil society is yielding very positive results. And I think we just need to find the way and, and pave the way to have many more of these golden uh, uh, triangle uh, partnerships as we go through the 21st century starting now. Because if we don't, those disparities are going to grow. And the have and have nots are going to grow. And the thing that I worry the most on that chart, um, that worries me, uh, gives me the highest worry, is um, that the social mosaic that we know today is not going to last if we continue to have 200 million unemployed and the rate of losing traditional jobs versus creating new technology jobs now is in favor, unfortunately, of losing traditional white collar type jobs and administrative jobs. One million net a year right now, based on the latest human capital report of the World Economic Forum um, Trustee Council for Employment, which I'm the chair of. So uh, I think um, the solution lies in creative partnerships gener uh, utilizing technology. Uh, Matsi Melissa, how do we pave the way for young people in Africa? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting one, but my fair belief is that education is the nucleus of bridging this gap. Um, what do you do when you cannot comprehend the opportunities that are existing? What do you do when you are not able to you know, take advantage of the, what exists within your platform? I mean, there's a high level of uh, people are very illiterate. Um, it's important that education forms the basis of our ability to bridge this gap. Um, we have to be able to feed people with the skills and the capability to do something because we're talking about the fourth industrial generation, uh, revolution. Um, a lot of the people where I come from are still in the second industrial revolution. How do we move them? How do we make them leapfrog? But as a young African, it's a function of, I don't want to think of playing catch up to the rest of the world and leapfrogging to the fourth industrial um, revolution. It's a function of how do young Africans lead the fourth industrial revolution, not leapfrogging and not playing catch up. Will, you were talking about that, leading that revolution and not only aspiring to be part of something that is uh, not a transcendental change. Yeah, it's, a, it's about focus, right? And, um, and who's going to shed, shed skin and take risks? Um, so, and how young do you start? So there's this guy that one of my heroes, his name is Dean Kamen. He has this program called First Robotics. Mm -hmm. And Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola company, are, are, are one of the folks that help sustain First Robotics to you know, teach kids early on at nine years old to build robots. So you know, I believe that it's about focus, dedication, sacrifice, and commitment. Right? There's a lot of wealthy people in Africa. There's a lot of you know, people that are willing to work. Why, I don't understand why we just can't uh, make it happen. Why, and it's by starting early and having an earmark for 20 years from now. 
Right? So if you start at nine years old and you build it and you educate them and inspire them and encourage them, what does 20 years look like? Right? If you go back just less than seven years ago, there wasn't apps. There was no such thing as app, as app developers when, because the iPhone wasn't out. Right? Nokia was the giant. <laughs> Nokia doesn't even exist today. So a lot can happen in 10 years. So I, I am, I'm, I'm a super optimistic. So when I see those worry charts, I'm like, OK. Uh, <laughs> let's put our optimism goggles on and start early at nine years old and go. Don't, don't try to influence our, our poll here. We're trying to <laughs> see the results at the end. You're already on the change right no, away. No, but you scared them by, by putting worries up. I'm like, hey, optimism first. <laughs> boom, boom. Now let's go and get busy. <laughs> Uh, Will, you, Will, you mentioned uh, starting early, and I, I can't agree more. We shouldn't underestimate the potential of young people. Uh, I myself got started in the tech industry at the age of 12. Um, I was fortunate that my dad is an electrical engineer, and we had a computer at home, and, and, and we had books at home. But one day, I was homesick from school, and I just started looking at the books. I was curious. And that was the beginning of me teaching myself how to program, um, buying more books. Um, and I taught myself everything I needed to know about computers. Uh, outside of school, and it became the basis of a business that I ran throughout high school and uh, used it to later pay for my college education. Um, more important than that, though, was the confidence it created in me that I could teach myself anything I put my mind to and that I could create things that other people valued. Um, and I know there's, there's so many young people, um, we got to realize that they're capable of so much. We, we, of course, have to create the environment, though, where they can learn. They have to have access to, to the material, whether it's through school um, or through the library um, or a community center or their families. Um, but I think starting early is, is so important. It puts you on a fundamentally different trajectory. Fast forward 10, 20 years, uh, and you can be just totally somewhere else. Um, can, I, can, I, can I just Sure, add go ahead, yeah. So you were encouraged. And you, we can't underestimate the power of encouragement, yeah. right? So less than 70 years ago, there wasn't a country called Singapore either. <laughs> right? So a lot can, you can do, uh, Africa could change dramatically in, you know, in the future, right? So Bangalore, India, I went there in 2006. It is, Bangalore, India is transformed, right, because of tech. Right, and people in Africa have cell phones, but they just, no one's telling them that they can participate in this conversation around disruption and transformation. You can learn everything on that, but no one's telling them how to learn on their own. Right, so there's a lot you can do. It's amazing, you mentioned cell phones. Uh, you know, now a kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more technology and more information than what Bill Clinton had when he was in the White House. Just so that's how far we've come. Just really quickly, because I always complain that Latin America comes last, and I'm doing that to Rodrigo <laughs> and Tejero. Uh, you know, talking about inequality and opportunity, Rodrigo, we come from a region with uh, you know, uh, critical inequality. Uh, just to mention my case, in Mexico, we have more than 50 million people living in extreme poverty or below the poverty line. Around 5 million people living in extreme poverty, I think it's a figure. Um, talk about inequality in opportunity in Latin America briefly, if you want. Look, I, think, I mean, most of the problems in the world also are, also are solved with growth, and growth comes from productivity. And productivity comes from technology. And uh, what I said before on technology, on connectivity and smartphones, is just these two technologies are making a huge difference for the opportunities of so many young people, uh, for education, for work, for doing so many things. And uh, I think that's something that, with the example I showed before of my own company and how we've been able to do it all across Latin America, it shows the potential of, of the smartphone, of the internet, of really allowing billions of people across the, uh, the world to really have access because this distribution platform is incredibly efficient. And I, I help out in different uh, organizations and there's one that go to slums and you actually see people, very poor, with smartphones and, and they use practically everything on those. They use WhatsApp, Facebook and, and, and the potential of learning and, uh, from there is just dramatic. So I'm, 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 and those dreams I think today uh, are being equalized in a sense because of that opportunity of being connected to the world. 
And I think the smartphone is the connection to the world. And thanks to the internet, it's something that we have to do so most of the people in the world can have connectivity. And that's, I think, one of the most important things so we can equalize dreams and equalize the opportunities for everybody. I guess as people become more connected, they become more aware and more conscious of their rights. And that has had a huge backsla backsla uh, backlash from corporations and governments. How do we do this golden triangle of collaboration that we're talking about? One of the things that we're talking about here, of course, is the importance of education, learning. You mm. talked about it. Uh, we'll talk about it. And, and I think one of the impediments that we have to, barriers that we have to get rid of, is that if you go around the world, most of the places, Latin America, Asia, Africa, even in the Western world, the, the percentage of schools, K, you know, one through 12 schools that have access to high-speed internet, you would be amazed how low, sing, low single digits in most of the world, countries around the world. If you go to Africa, you know, in total, two, three percent. Um, Mexico, um, less than 10 percent. And so, I think what, that's one of the things that we have to start working on, all of us, the golden triangle. What can we all do? And one of the interesting things that happened to me the, uh, over the last sort of 12 months is that there's a company, a startup in the United States called OneWeb, set up by a fellow called Greg Weiler. And they're building satellites, low cost satellites, small satellites, that they're going to launch in the next 24 months. Other investors here are Branson, uh, Airbus, and Qualcomm, Paul Jacobs. And we went in with, uh, as a uh, uh, founding partner, investing in this company for, the, for a different reason. Why we went in is to exactly that, provide, help provide high-speed internet to schools around continents like Africa, to jumpstart. Because you don't need cables. Once the, the, the 600 satellites are launched at a low orbit, about 80 kilometers instead of 400 kilometers, the normal satellite orbit, you can actually generate high-speed internet with an antenna half the size of this little portfolio. And a country, middle-sized country, say a Colombia or Argentina, mm -hmm. you'd be able to, you would spend no more than $20 million to get 100% coverage in all schools for high-speed internet. Imagine what that can do, what, what, how that can leapfrog and change the paradigm. And the other thing is, you know, I checked how many ministers of education there are here at Davos this year. How many? Well, um, not, not, not a handful, not a handful. So uh, we have ministers of finance, we have ministers of trade, ministers of agriculture, every kind of minister. We don't have ministers of education. Maybe that's why the web says this year is going to be worse than the last one. Yeah, well, I don't know. But I think, I, think, I think we need to put everything in scale. Without this leapfrogging and without giving people access, equalizing you, that, that word, in the rest of the world, um, I think we're not going to get there. And I think with equalization, through disruption and through technology like, you know, uh, OneWeb that is going to provide this kind of access to high-speed internet, I think there's a chance. Uh, just wanted to ask Nathan about uh, Airbnb in Cuba. That started last year and it's an interesting case because when we talk about, um, you know, awareness, people uh, more conscious of their rights and the, the backlash that I was referring to from governments and corporations. I think that, that could be a good example. So uh, I got to go down to Cuba uh, last year around, I think it was April time, May. No, May. And uh, it was really interesting. Uh, in Cuba, there's not a lot of connectivity. Uh, there's connectivity for government employees. There's connectivity at universities. But the average person doesn't have access to the internet, uh, or at least not affordably so. Um, and yet, they have managed, they meaning the average person has managed to get access to a lot of content. Uh, I met with some entrepreneurs, and I was curious, what is a Cuban entrepreneur like? Uh, and this Cuban entrepreneur had seen a video on YouTube um, about the Airbnb success story and was excited about some of the lessons that he thought he had learned uh, and wanted to talk to me about it. And I was blown away. I said, how did you get access to YouTube down in Cuba? But they've come up with a system to, 
to work around the don't, lack don't of Don't reveal their system because we don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is public. <laughs> but, but basically, someone downloads the internet and, and, and content onto physical drives, you know, big one terabyte drives, and you can go to this uh, store and, and pick your programs and get it on a flash drive wow. uh, and, and, and watch videos. Uh, so it was amazing to see how resourceful people can be uh, when, when some of these uh, things are missing. Um, yeah, incredible. Will, you, you want to say something uh, about uh, internet? Yeah, so uh, last year was my first year coming to Davos, and I met Greg from OneWeb, and he was with Richard Branson, and I was just sponging up you know, this dream he had on a new constellation of satellites. And then a couple of months later, I'm in London with Muchar. We're talking about a sustainability project that we have called EcoCycle. And he tells me about OneWeb. I said, well, I've, I've met Greg. Can you tell him that I want to be involved in OneWeb? Because my vision on what I'm doing in my neighborhood and take, you know, taking that and scaling it and bringing it to other parts of the world, OneWeb would be perfect. So I'm not just a blind optimist. Because I sponge up the world so much, um, there's a lot of solutions out there. It's just about connecting those dots. And you know, OneWeb is you know, that technology allowing everyone to have access to the internet. But more importantly, once they have it, you don't want them just thumbing through dumb stuff. You got to get them and encourage them to be a part of this conversation, discipline themselves, and give them tomorrow's tools so they could write code, build robots, and compete. Like, who ever thought? that a little guy can compete with a big guy. Look at Airbnb. Whoever thought that they could really disrupt hotels? I remember the first time you were there. I went to Airbnb to visit their offices one time, and I was like, I don't get it. <laughs> Do you remember that? 2011, I was like, wow, well, I like hotels. I don't get it. And then today, I was like, OK, yeah. um, I feel like a fool, because I remember that. And he's like, he could really be like, yeah, motherfucker. Like, he could really, he could, he could really like, put me in my place. But thank you so much for being Very so Very gracious of you, guy. Nathan, not to do that. But that goes to show you like, a lot of people probably told him that. A lot of people probably said, you, cannot, you can't move the needle. Hotels are too big. What are you guys thinking? But you know, when you encourage folks and you have willing people that are dedicated, look at what you can do. Look at Uber. Look what they did. Yep. You know, look at the unlikely candidate, Apple. They were not in the phone business. They changed phones forever. The same thing can happen to folks that were always left behind. As soon as you push them and you give them the tools, poof, watch what happens. So, so let's connect the dots. Uh, connecting this discussion to the broader conversation here in Davos. Um, the, the new Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, phenomenal leader, um, yesterday he said, technology needs to serve the cause of human progress, not serve as a substitute for it. And we were talking about the promise of technology in this panel, but what about some of the perils of, of technology? And um, you know, when you want to leapfrog from the second industrial revolution to the fourth industrial revolution, what are some of the, the, the perils of technology for uh, people in Africa, for example? Well, I think an enabler of technology would probably be infrastructure. So without electricity, there's no internet. So let's just start with the basics. We talk about um, you know, a partnership between the public, the private, and the civil society. We need to invest in the infrastructure, because without the infrastructure, people don't have access. So we essentially have to identify what are the key um, elements that will actually enable this technology and make sure that everybody does have access to it. So I'm one of those people that's constantly promoting that people need to have access to the corrective infrastructure. We need to invest in the infrastructure. Um, and, and let's talk about millennials, because that's, that's something that's you know, um, a key component of the conversation here at Davos, and their expectations in terms of being part of the workplace, in terms of sustainability, uh, gender equality. Just a quick note, 82% of the 2,500 participants this year at Davos are men. Only 18% uh, are women. Just one woman on our panel. Just saying. Um, <laughs> but gender equality is some, one of the expectations for millennials. You work in a millennial uh, workspace. Uh, Nathan, tell us uh, about, uh, about their expectations in terms of uh, moving forward. At Airbnb, I think the, the median age is probably about 29. Uh, and there's not, not that much spread on that. Uh, so it's a very young workplace. Um, 
everybody who comes to Airbnb uh, comes for the mission. The mission is to create a world where 7 billion people can belong anywhere. Anywhere doesn't just mean geographically, it means outside of your comfort zone. So we're, we're very values-based, and I think that's a, a pattern you see amongst young workers, is they wanna, they wanna work uh, for purpose. Uh, it really matters, and um, we see that internally. Um, you know, all these issues around inequality um, and, and having more women in leadership positions um, and, and LGBT um, uh, equality um, are all things that the employees are in incredibly passionate about. And, and, and that we take extra time to model internally so we can project that externally. Um, um, LGBT equality, that's, that's something that Vice President Joe Biden mentioned in, in a breakfast and it singled out two people on our panel, Muther Kent and you, Nathan. Uh, what are you doing as a corporation, Coca-Cola company, to advance this agenda of uh, gay rights in the world? Well, I, I think you know the broader thing. Uh, yeah, the broader picture is that you know our, our consumers, uh, particularly the young consumers, um, no longer actually just only want a good product, a uh, product that tastes good, a uh, product that feels good, but they want to also ensure that whoever produces those goods and services, uh, the character of the the people that produce them, the company, is also matches their character as it relates to the. Uh, planet, as it relates to sustainability, as it relates to making communities stronger, as it relates to the whole equation of, of how stakeholders um, actually are value for stakeholders are created, all stakeholders. So I think, uh, you know, that I think is, is critical. Within that equation, um, you know, if diversity is, is key to attracting the best talent in the world, as was just expressed. And uh, from that perspective, um, um, diversity for religion, diversity for race, diversity for gender, and diversity for uh, um, uh, you know every single type of individual has to be uh, respected in a corporation and upheld uh, the dignity, and that's what we do at, at Coca. We're one of the first companies that uh, actually. Uh, put LGBT couples uh, in um, advertising. And um, I think that was a big breakthrough. Um, and, and obviously, you know, everything else inside the company, um, you know, in, with, in terms of rights and, uh, for LGBT uh, couples, uh, which we uphold. But I think, importantly, going out and um, portraying um, uh, LGBT couples um, in our advertising was really important um, breakthrough. Okay. Rodrigo, what, what, are, what are the role of the corporations in advancing the millennium agenda, climate change? Uh, we talked about uh, gender equality, uh, LGBT rights, others. What is the role of the company? Look, what I would add actually right now is, um, I mean, millennials have uh, come of age in, in globalization, in this tech uh, disruption. I mean, they're, they're digital natives. And um, these people are, are, are going to be expecting another way to relate to the world. And that's probably going to change all types of industries. I, I think that the concept of people using Uber and expecting that type of response for everything is something that's very important. And that's uh, in my sector, in fintech, for example, there was a survey that it said that millennials, 71% of them prefer to go to the dentist than to go to the bank. And, and these kind of things are, are, are just mind-boggling, right? But the expectation, really, of getting things instant is very important. And uh, so, so companies that, that solve those problems are, are the companies that are going to thrive. And probably all the industries will be changed because of, the, of this behavior that millennials have. And in that sort, for sure, they're, they're, they, they, they love diversity. They, they accept it. They, lo they, they like to work and uh, have a balanced life. And, uh, and pursue a purpose. They, 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 they want to work on things that they love. And uh, I think that's just being genuine to oneself, right? Is, is um, accepting themselves and accepting others. And I think that's a, a very important part of what you buy and how you work. You've certainly understood that very well at Recarga Pay. Uh, I'm going to open uh, the floor to questions from our audience. We have one question over here and one question over there from one of our global shapers. And then uh, on social media, we're going to take one question from social media so our team can be ready after these two questions. 
Thank you so much. My name is Federico Rivas, and I'm a global shaper from the San Salvador Hub. In the words of Professor Hausman, an increase in productivity reduces income inequality in the world. And that is why I applaud Will I Am's foundation, because it's exactly what you're doing connecting kids into a global economy by giving those skill sets of coding, of Mandarin, et cetera. But however, uh, half of this world is young, and in regions like Africa and Latin America, well, where I come from, and El Salvador, kids with their free time, they, they have to, they, they're forced to join gangs and are forced to all sorts of terrors on their day to day. So I want to ask our tech experts on the panel today, like, how quickly will uh, these developing regions will be fully integrated on this fourth industrial revolution? How quickly will this jump from the second to the fourth will, will come? And, and how optimistic are you that, that this science will, will save our youth? Well, I, I don't necessarily think this is just a, a technology problem. I mean, technology might be able to help, it might be one input. But I think uh, role models is something we didn't talk much about. Will mentioned it a little bit. Um, but I think role models are so uh, important to setting someone on the right trajectory and motivating them uh, to think bigger. So, um, you know, in, in some places your role model might be a gang member, and, and that's going to be a hard thing to overcome. Um, many people's, young people's role models are professional athletes, and, and, and that's great, but not everyone's going to be a professional athlete. Um, how do we get more young people to understand uh, that they can teach themselves how to code, that they can start a business? that they can do something that others really value um, and really take control of their destiny. I think uh, we as society need to think about how can we make those role models um, more visible um, into communities that might not be um, having access to those kinds of messages. And that's a powerful message in, in the age of uh, recruiting power of uh, organizations like ISIS, for example. Uh, Will I am? Um, being raised in an area where you know, gangs was normal. Gun violence, you know, teenage deaths, um, senseless shooting, um, new type of entrepreneurs um, selling illegal stuff. That was normal for me. And what you gotta look at it for what it truly is. No gang, they have a product they sell. They're not just a gang to be a gang. Hey, let's go out and be violent. That's not. There's a product they sell. And a terrorist. There's some product they sell. But we don't look at it as business. So businesses have to be competitive and adopt and recruit earlier. Right? Because the workforce will get swallowed up. Right? That's why there's so many jobs unfilled in the tech sector. And those jobs will change communities forever. That's the reason why I'm focused there. Right? So I go to my kids and be like, hey, well, who are you guys going to be? El Chapo, Carlos Slim. I was born in an all-Mexican neighborhood. Right? Everyone, I was the only black family. So who are you guys going to be, El Chapo or Carlos Slim? The possibilities of being Carlos Slim, you don't have to risk your life. El Chapo, you probably would never be El Chapo. But let's see the amount of money you can make being Carlos Slim. Right, so when you paint it that simple for them, of course the choice is going to be like, oh wow, I want to code. I want to build robots. That's the reason why the recruitment starting at 60, now I have 322 kids and a waiting list because I fund it. You know, if I don't fund it, I have to, if I don't raise money, I have to pay for it myself. And for the past, you know, since I started it, I've been paying for it myself. But it's great because the results are awesome. Our kids this year, like I said, they'll go to Harvard and MIT. And these are, on my phone, my star student, I have her as little triggers. Because in the video, she was little triggers because she held the gun at 12. So what do you do? So I want to change my neighborhood. That's simple. I met General Colin Powell. And uh, this is 2008, uh, 2009 after Obama was elected. And I played my, uh, a part on um, you know, getting young people to you know, apply themselves and, and, and share their voice and vote. I said, hey, General Colin Powell, what do you think I should do next? You know, how do I get the youth to stay active? He said, well, you should focus on your neighborhood. That you can change without any assistance. I was like, wow. I was like, and then Mark Benioff said the same thing. He, his one one-on-one -on -one program with Salesforce was 
He was inspired by General Colin Powell. So there's some people that push you. And so I'm, I'm here to, to continue to push. But you got to see it, how simple it is. It's business and business. A big business needs to compete a little bit harder because these gangs, you know, they have a product. Just like in the early 20s, alcohol was an illegal product. Now there's big companies selling alcohol. <laughs> right. Pro, you know, that was, it was illegal to sell it. Now it's legal. But this new thing is a little different. So we have to be a little bit more conscious on um, the recruitment and what they could turn into. Uh, like in the political debates, you were mentioned, so you, you, you have the right to reply, Mr. Kent. <laughs> well, I'm not replying. I'm just uh, adding the point. Um, I can't stress the importance of families, um, uh, mothers spe specifically, and, and therefore I think um, you know, doing something about education through creating empowerment for mothers is critical. And let me just give you an example. What we see across Brazil, many countries in Africa where we've created economic empowerment for women, identify the woman, give them basic training, basic accounting, basic stock rotation, basic retail techniques and distribution techniques. Link them with microcredit from the IFC. And these 835,000 women that so far we've been able to economically empower, they really care about their communities. All the money that they earn, they spend in their communities. All the money that they earn, they try to educate their kids. And then once those kids are connected, you, will, you have a, a huge sea change. So I, I can't stress the importance of creating economic empowerment models, simple models that create economic empowerment for women in these areas where a tremendous amount of inequality exists is a huge sea change if we can do it. And if we can't, I will tell you, then there will be 500 million more unemployed, and all that will be fresh ground, ripe ground for recruitment. Yeah. Recruitment by gangs, recruitment by terrorists, recruitment by every negative thing that generates misery. Um, so um, we get to the last question. I'll let you two answer that last, last question. Maria, go ahead. You can stand up and introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, they're going to answer that last question. Hello, uh, my name is Mariel Reed, and uh, I'm a global shaper as well from the San Francisco hub. Uh, and I also work at Coursera uh, in the Bay Area, which is the largest massive open online course platform. And I wanted to pull a couple of things together. Um, I'm really glad that young people are so well represented and that there's been such a focus on what we're doing to, uh, to make sure that young people are included in the future. Um, but we also see that there's this huge, huge disruption of work, uh, manufacturing, it's going to touch basically all aspects of life. Um, and so my question really is, oh, and by the way, people are living a lot longer too. So, um, so my question is, what are we doing to think about an inclusive future, uh, not just focused on the next generation, but this generation and even above it, um, to make sure that the people that are around now are not also left out of this kind of digital future? Matsi and Rodrigo, you close out. Go ahead, Matsi. Sure. It ties on to a point that I wanted to make earlier and an emphasis on education. I think we have to revisit how we educate our youth. Um, in South Africa, there is 25% unemployment and 62% of young people are unemployed. So that says something about you now get young people into a system for 16 years of their life. They come out, they now go into university. They come out, then they have a situation where they're not employable or the economy is not able to absorb them into, you know, into, into the labor force. Um, so there's clearly something very wrong in what we're teaching young people. Um, you know, Kusera, I'm glad that you're actually part of that because that's essentially, I feel, the way the world should be going. Um, you know, when you're young, you're told you have to train as a lawyer, as a doctor, as a teacher. And nobody tells you about um, getting a nano degree. I think I only heard about getting nano degrees last year, that I can actually go online and educate myself with whatever subject matter I feel I'm lacking in or I'm passionate in. So it's a function of how do we revisit the education system that we have? Because from a young age of you know, zero to six, you're just absorbing. 
And then once you now go into primary school, um, you know, high school, it's a function of now you are being forced to learn things that you might not necessarily want to learn or you have a natural ability to learn. So I really, really think that education has to be revisited. And it's an integral part of teaching young people uh, skills of the future. You know, coding is very, very important. I'm part of a, um, you know, what we call code tribe in South Africa. Young people from disadvantaged um, communities, um, they don't necessarily have the opportunity to be educated because it is a small minority of us that can go to um, high institutions of high learning. So it's a function of how do you then give young people skills that they don't necessarily really have to learn at university because that is still a privilege in this day and age. So nano uh, degrees, um, Coursera, that's the future. We need to start now integrating that into the mainstream um, systems of education. Um, Rodrigo, I'm going to start our, our final uh, remarks and I'll start with you. So um, let's make it really concrete and say the one thing, the one actual thing you'll do when you step off this stage to fulfill your 21st century dream and help others fulfill theirs. So the one thing you'll be doing to, um, to fulfill your 21st century dream. Look, I, I really believe that entrepreneurship is, is, is the future in a sense of helping other people in, in, in my country, in, in the region, in the world, and, and, and connecting uh, as well our region with the rest of the world. We've just come from 10 years in Argentina from a very closed economy. And now with our new president, Magri, things are looking much better. So in that sort, personally, I'm trying to help connect civil society more into the region as well as in Argentina, but particularly on the side of entrepreneurship with different uh, organizations. Well, the fourth industrial revolution is still a dream, uh, but we have to talk about we are here now. Um, going forward, we don't know what to expect. Going forward, we don't know, we will learn as we go along, but I think in the world of robotics, we have to be human about it. As we rise, we have to pick everybody else, and young people have the responsibility of being revolutionaries in this revolution. So one thing you'll be doing, one practical thing you'll be well, doing? Well, pushing entrepreneurship and continue being an activist on the continent and giving young Africans a dream and saying, you can do it. You have, there's nothing different to you than anybody in San Francisco. And for us and for myself is how do I give them those skills and those tools and enable them? Thank you so much. And, and I, all, all I would do is just make sure that we can compress time to get to our goals of these five women, million women empowered and then also try to play a, an important role in providing connectivity through this, uh, th these interesting disruptive investments. Um, just push the agenda um, faster and better on those um, and, and make sure that those satellites get up and make sure that they provide what they are promised to provide. Nathan the Charsic. Uh, I'll continue to share my own story but also identify those uh, in our community um, that are becoming micro entrepreneurs and, and using that as a as a step change in their lives and making sure those stories are heard uh, in the community. And Will, you get the last word. Um, <laughs> taking what I started in my uh, ghetto, it's it's a success. It works. There's a person in the audience that I know is going to help me uh, in Africa um, to take what I what I'm doing where I'm from. And I, I believe there's a calling. I, I woke up today like, why and how am I here? Because where I come from, I should either be in prison, shot, on drugs, or selling drugs. Because everybody in my neighborhood, those are the results. But my mom, she guided me to apply myself and to help. And I want to take what, I've, what I'm already doing and, and take it to Africa, and, and she's going to help me do that. <laughs> so yes, a warm round of applause for our distinguished panel, William Adams, Nathan Lecharsik, Mutor Kent, Matsing Modise, and Rodrigo Tejero. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it.